Welcome to Chester Cathedral Library. I'm George Brooke, uh, one of the volunteer library consultants uh, here at uh, Chester Cathedral. Each year for the last 10 years, uh, we have put together a small exhibition in the Cathedral Library. Uh, and in 2020, I have curated an exhibition that celebrates the 100th anniversary since the installation of Dean Frank Bennett as the Dean of Chester. He was installed in June 1920 uh, and he was an amazing man. He did uh, some very uh, interesting things both uh, in the cathedral but also in setting the cathedral in its place within the diocese as the mother church. So what I wish to do in the next few minutes is to introduce you to Dean Bennett and some of his uh, ideas and uh, his collaborative work with the Bishop of Chester in his day. So let me introduce you to Dean Bennett. Here he is uh, in this cabinet uh, in a postcard that was printed in Liverpool in the early 1920s as part of an ecclesiastical series. Um, remarkable that there should be series of postcards devoted to ecclesiastical figures. Um, but Bennett was never one to shrink from a little bit of publicity. Uh, how did he become Dean of Chester? There's a very widely recounted story uh, about how his nomination uh, came about. When Lloyd George was due to nominate a new dean to Chester, he was staying at a country house, and old Dr Edwards was a fellow guest. Dr Edwards was Bishop of St Asaph and became Archbishop of Wales. At the end of the day, as they walked upstairs, each holding his silver bedroom candlestick, Lloyd George said, just one more question. I have to find a dean for Chester. Any suggestions? The Archbishop rubbed his cold nose, as he always did when he was thinking hard, or about to give the blessing in full pontificals. Hmm, hmm. I think the Rector of Harden would do. And indeed, uh, Dean Bennett, uh, before becoming the Dean, uh, was Rector of Harden in North Wales, just a few miles from Chester. He'd been uh, the Rector there for uh, 10 years, uh, but before that he had spent all of his ministry uh, in the Diocese of Chester. Uh, he had become, as a layman, Secretary to Bishop Jane of Chester, uh, in 1890 uh, and then was ordained by Bishop Jane as deacon in 1892 and subsequently as priest, uh, becoming then the bishop's chaplain. Uh, after a little while he became the vicar of Portwood in Stockport in 1897 uh, for 10 years and then moved to Christchurch in Chester itself. So, uh, when the Bishop of St Asaph recommended uh, the Rector of Harden as the new Dean of Chester, it was a remarkably insightful suggestion uh, which the Prime Minister took up, uh, because here was a man with much experience in the Diocese of Chester, um, who knew the Diocese well, uh, both as Bishop's Secretary, Bishop's Chaplain, but also as a priest in the diocese, but who'd taken some time outside the diocese before his appointment was confirmed. When Bennett learnt of his uh, appointment as Dean of Chester, he immediately set about doing some research, uh, and he was delighted to discover that deans of new foundation cathedrals, such as Chester, that is, cathedrals established uh, since the Reformation, um, that deans in such cathedrals, their constitutions enabled them to have a much freer hand 
than the older established cathedrals from Norman times. Um, this meant that he could immediately begin to put together a strategy for how he wanted to develop the life uh, of the cathedral. Uh, so it was no surprise when uh, uh, the first Sunday uh, after his installation, he preached a sermon in the cathedral which amounted to a manifesto. And it set out an agenda for how he envisaged the cathedral to be uh, restructured, uh, its organization, what its purpose was, and so forth. And uh, much of that he continued to reflect on uh, so that uh, very soon uh, he became one of the principal voices about the place of cathedrals in national life. Uh, in 1925, he published an important book, The Nature of a Cathedral. We have several copies of it here in the Cathedral Library. Uh, and this little book was, in effect, a development of the points he'd made in his inaugural sermon in the cathedral back in June 1920. Uh, the book became very influential uh, because it showed how cathedrals should be uh, opening up to welcome uh, folk of all kinds uh, and that they should become dynamic hubs uh, within their dioceses. Um, one of the things which uh, Bennett set about uh, immediately was the abolition of admission charges to Chester Cathedral. Uh, the cathedral uh, that he inherited had some considerable debt, so this was a bold venture to think of abolishing uh, admission charges, but he wanted the cathedral to be open uh, without fence or fee was his favourite phrase, and that phrase, without fence or fee, actually features in the memorial tablet uh, to him, which is uh, at the east end of the nave uh, in Chester Cathedral to this day. So the abolition of fees, but also the restructuring of how residentiary canons should work. Uh, he abolished the idea of three-month tenures, uh, rather thinking that canons should be permanently living in Chester and that uh, they should become part of a prayer cell uh, that he was keen to establish with a daily Eucharist. Uh, and so he set about changing the spiritual uh, dynamic, the prayer life uh, of the cathedral and reorganizing uh, the uh, staff of the um, with the salaries that he saved by abolishing two of the residentiary canonries, um, he was able to increase the uh, pay of the vergers uh, and also uh, of the cathedral organists. So he set about uh, reorganizing cathedral life in a number of ways, uh, particularly on the estate. Um, he wanted to uh, work with the bishop to make uh, Abbey Square and the cathedral itself um, the mother church of the diocese. Uh, the bishop agreed that number 12, uh, Abbey Square, should become the diocesan offices. Uh, Dean Bennett established number 11 as a diocesan uh, retreat house, encouraging diocesan clergy to come and spend time on retreat in Chester uh, and during such times they would use the cathedral and benefit from it and he took back the uh, cathedral refectory from the King's School and made it into a place of uh, hospitality for all those visiting the cathedral but most especially so that it could be used uh, for the annual diocesan conference when all the diocesan clergy would come to Chester uh, for um, meeting with the bishop uh, on an annual uh, basis. So through these changes, he was able to uh, make the cathedral uh, a central focus of the diocesan uh, 
life uh, and encourage the clergy to see that the cathedral was there for their benefit. So Bennett wanted to establish a very good and constructive relationship with the clergy of the diocese. And one of the ways he uh, thought through of uh, helping this positive relationship develop was by publishing each year the cathedral accounts in the diocesan gazette, which all clergy received. Uh, in this way, he wanted to challenge any misconceptions that the cathedral was a wealthy uh, uh, undertaking. Uh, but uh, through publishing the accounts, it became clear that Bennett was a very good manager of the cathedral estate and that the books, um, having been in deficit when he became dean, uh, were very soon balanced. Any profit put back into the cathedral estate for its enhancement. And some of those enhancements included things which would be of particular benefit to diocesan clergy. Uh, for example, he established a library and reading room um, in the area which is now the undercroft and gift shop. And he made the equivalent of a sort of um, uh, Oxbridge common room for clergy in what is now the cloister room. Uh, so that when clergy visited Chester, maybe with business in bus and house, uh, or perhaps on retreat in the uh, retreat house, uh, they would also have places within the cathedral itself that they could enjoy and uh, take advantage of. As I've mentioned, uh, Dean Bennett had spent most of his ministry as a parish priest, and during that time, he had not published uh, any books or pamphlets. Uh, but when he became dean, he began to write uh, a number of different uh, treatises and uh, book books, uh, articles uh, of all sorts. In fact, he became also a regular contributor to the letters page of the Times. Um, we've already seen that he wrote uh, his sermon manifesto into a popular book. Um, amongst his other interests, perhaps stimulated by the large loss of life uh, in the First World War, was his thinking uh, about the doctrine of resurrection. Um, there was quite a debate about this uh, in the late teens and in uh, the 1920s, and Bennett tried to make his own contribution uh, to the debate, though most theologians of the day actually uh, ignored what he had to say. Uh, he was uh, particularly concerned to combine some of the uh, ideas which he reflected upon from uh, medieval theology um, with some of the latest scientific thinking, uh, particularly those sciences which wanted to say that the universe was in some way a complete entity. Uh, to that end, he was uh, particularly concerned in his works uh, Expecto, uh, A Biology of the World to Come, uh, in his longer book, The Resurrection of the Dead, published in 1929, and in a follow-up pamphlet called the resurrection of the organism, particularly concerned in those works, to stress the physicality of the resurrection body. Uh, he wasn't interested in promoting the immortal soul, uh, but the resurrection body uh, as a physical entity, in some way continuous uh, with the body of the person during their earthly life. I think this uh, intriguing stress on the physicality of the resurrection body is in some ways uh, also reflected in the period uh, in the art of Stanley Spencer, uh, both in the Memorial Chapel at Birdclear, uh, but also in Spencer's uh, 
paintings of resurrection uh, at Cookham now in the Tate Gallery, in which the risen bodies uh, are very substantially represented. Um, they are obviously concrete entities, um, physical bodies themselves. Uh, Bennett also became uh, involved uh, in, interestingly, in uh, the commemoration of the dead and uh, in Chester was responsible for uh, encouraging the uh, town council to endorse his idea that there should be a war memorial uh, cross uh, outside the uh, southwest uh, door of the cathedral on cathedral land and that is used still uh, for many ceremonies that uh, uh, commemorate those who have lost their lives um, in war. But in addition to changing the use of the rooms around the edge of the cathedral cloisters and turning the refectory into a place of hospitality uh, and welcome, uh, Dean Bennett knew that uh, the cloisters themselves needed to be warm and welcoming and that this required for them to be glazed. Uh, the two previous deans, Dean Darby and before him Dean Howson, had paid considerable attention to restoring the stonework, the tracery, within the cloister windows um, and you can see those in this picture here. Uh, but uh, they hadn't glazed them. For warmth and welcome, Dean Bennett had set about a project which took him longer than he thought it would uh, to raise money um, from individual donors so that uh, each window could be glazed. Overall, he proposed there should be a liturgical theme to the cloister windows, that the, uh, each light would depict a saint or a festival from the liturgical calendar. Um, it's intriguing to see that the first light uh, in the northern range of the cloister is dedicated to St. Benedict. And I think Dean Bennett delighted in this, not only because uh, Benedict had provided the uh, spiritual ethos for the Abbey, which was a Benedictine foundation, but also because the name Benedict uh, was uh, related to his own name, Bennett. Um, and in the window, you can see a number of features reflecting uh, the name Bennett. Uh, there's a little rebus that plays on his name, a bee and a net. Uh, also, his family arms can be seen in the light. In addition to his desire to welcome all the diocesan clergy to the cathedral site, uh, Bennett was also very concerned with providing a warm welcome for every visitor. Uh, in fact, he seldom referred to people coming to the cathedral as visitors. Uh, rather, his preferred nomenclature was pilgrim, and he invested a lot of energy in appreciating visitors as pilgrims. He set about uh, providing a number of different uh, encouragements to local church groups and so forth uh, to come to Chester uh, as pilgrims. He discovered that during the time of the Abbey, the cathedral as a focus for um, celebrating St. Werburg uh, had produced a pilgrim badge and he had this reproduced from one that survived in the British Museum. Uh, in the official portrait that was um, uh, made when Bennett retired and which is kept here in the Cathedral Library, 
Uh, Bennett himself is seen standing in his cloisters, now nice and warm, all glazed, but wearing his pilgrim badge. So the theme of pilgrim creating the cathedral as a centre of pilgrimage was close to his heart. Uh, to that end, he provided uh, small guidebooks to the cathedral, which were dotted around the cathedral and available for threepence. And you put your money in a little box. Uh, there was nobody selling these. He trusted that visitors as pilgrims would be honest. And this little book uh, went through tens of thousands of uh, copies during his tenure as dean. He uh, established the Friends of Chester Cathedral as a way of encouraging people to visit as pilgrims. Uh, and he uh, used the figure of the pilgrim, uh, which is at the base of the dean's seat, the medieval carving, uh, as the logo of the Friends of Chester Cathedral, um, a logo which uh, lasted for uh, nearly a hundred years uh, as a symbol of the Cathedral Friends. Um, so pilgrimage was uh, his great interest. In one of the notes in the Diocesan Gazette, uh, he writes, during these last few weeks, we have been visited by any number of pilgrims from all over England and from overseas. Among them, happily, have been a larger proportion than ever before from our own diocese. Such, I always remind, that they can walk about and rest and pray with a sense of possession in what is the greatest and best of all that they feel is their very own. He wanted people to feel that they belong in fact, that the cathedral belonged to them. In addition to uh, Bennett's writings on the nature of the cathedral uh, and his interest in publishing about uh, the doctrine of resurrection, uh, he also uh, had an interest in uh, spirituality, in the psychology of the soul, and he wrote several items uh, about this. Uh, he was particularly influenced by a number of uh, contemporary uh, authors, uh, notably amongst them uh, Evelyn Underhill. Uh, uh, amongst them as well was the French psychologist uh, Emile Coué. Uh, he invited Emile Coué to come to the cathedral and Coué spoke to a packed refectory, 600 people in the audience. And Coué was known for being a positive thinker and suggesting that um, if you had a positive outlook on life, uh, this would be something that uh, encouraged you to have uh, mental well-being. And Bennett was much taken with this idea uh, and um, in inviting Coué to the cathedral uh, received a, a very uh, good response from people, um, including this uh, letter uh, from somebody who had attended and sent him a limerick, writing about Kue. This very remarkable man has hit on a capital plan. You can do what you want if you don't think you can't. So don't think you can't, think you can positive thinking. Uh, Bennett's own uh, reaction to Coué, he published in a little book called Coué and his Gospel Health. So he took Coué's ideas about positive thinking and Christianized them very explicitly in terms of health and well-being as part of the Gospel. In addition, he wrote uh, another little book called a soul in the making, or psychosynthesis, uh, the last word being a deliberate play on psychoanalysis. He saw psychoanalysis as 
somewhat destructive, taking apart the different parts of the personality uh, and analyzing each. Uh, he believed rather in this kind of uh, positive thinking approach in um, applying positive thinking so that the soul was developed as a cohesive entity uh, and the whole person uh, would have their own uh, well-being. And that well-being endorsed especially through prayer. Uh, Bennett uh, writes in his Soul in the Making that it's exceptionally important uh, always to end the day with a positive prayer of thanksgiving for what has taken place during the day so that one can sleep well and wake up in a positive mood. Intriguingly, his interest in uh, the psychology of the pilgrim uh, also uh, allowed him to uh, develop creatively some ideas about childhood uh, psychological and spiritual development which he published in a little book called Mary Jane and Harry John, which was very popular and which uh, promoted the idea that parents should not seek to impose their own spirituality on children. Rather, children should be allowed to develop their own insights uh, as they grew up. He was the first dean in the country to establish in his cathedral a children's corner uh, and we have some early photographs uh, of what the children's corner uh, looked like. Bennett of course was interested in the life of the Benedictine Abbey of St. Werburg. Uh, perhaps the most famous monk uh, of the Abbey of St. Werburg was Ranulf Higdon. Uh, he was the author of the famous Polychronicon, which for 200 years in uh, the Middle Ages uh, was the standard history book uh, in the curriculum uh, of uh, English nobility. In 1925, it was brought to the attention of Mrs. Paget, the bishop's wife, uh, that a copy of the Polychronicon a manuscript copy, possibly from the late 14th century, uh, within half a century of its uh, authorship, uh, was available for sale. Mrs. Paget put together a number of contributors uh, and they raised the money to purchase the Polychronicon for Chester Cathedral Library. And so Bennett received this in, in 1925. Uh, the particular copy uh, which we now have, uh, which you can see here, uh, is not the autograph copy by Higdon himself. That now belongs to uh, the Huntington Library in uh, California. Though intriguingly, both that uh, autograph copy and this Chester copy uh, were part of the 19th century collection of manuscripts that belonged to Sir Thomas Phillips. And Phillips's name features here uh, on the initial page of the surviving manuscript. So both these manuscripts belonged to Thomas Phillips's collection. He was um, a, uh, an avid manuscript collector in the 19th century and when he died uh, his family uh, inherited enormous debts which were still uh, owing to a number of uh, booksellers around the world. Um, the Phillips collection had to be broken up and sold off to pay off the debts. The manuscript that we now have in Chester Cathedral Library uh, begins, as do several others that survive, uh, with a world map. The Polychronicon is divided into seven books uh, to imitate the seven days of creation. And book one is largely a world 
geography, uh, the other books being the world history. Uh, so it's appropriate that the frontispiece in several copies of the Polychronicon is a world map. Uh, this is the Chester version of the standard medieval T-O map. That is, the O has the world surrounded by ocean, um, and the T is based on the fact that uh, the world has Jerusalem as its center, and uh, is, the map is oriented uh, with the east at the top. Uh, so forming the T is the River Nile and the River Don, uh, and the downstroke of the T uh, is the Mediterranean Sea. This means that uh, in these TO maps, the most famous of which is the Mappa Mundi uh, in Hereford Cathedral, um, the British Isles are on the uh, bottom uh, left-hand corner uh, of the map, uh, including uh, mention here of Hibernia, uh, Ireland. The Chester copy is uh, a very interesting and fine copy, uh, though only two of the several illuminated pages survive. And one of those begins book two uh, in the Polychronicon. Uh, you can see here the way in which it is uh, finely gilded. These pages were uh, cut out to be uh, mounted and framed uh, for wall hangings um, during the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. So many copies of medieval manuscripts uh, have lost their finest uh, illuminated pages. Dean Bennett must have been very pleased to uh, have this placed in his hands as the finest uh, component 